Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the fourth installment of the uh, Emerging Biological Magnetic Resonance Seminar series. Uh, today, uh, our first talk is going to be by Professor Melinda Dewar from Cambridge University. It's a pleasure to have her here. Uh, Melinda carried out uh, all her scientific studies, undergraduate, uh, PhD, and postdoctoral research at um, Cambridge University and uh, established her own independent lab at Cambridge as well after um, working on uh, transition metal complexes as a theoretical chemist she uh, discovered solid state NMR and has been developing and applying uh, solid state NMR techniques to study materials and about 10 years ago her lab has successfully started a project to understand biological tissues uh, and uh, investigating particularly the inorganic organic nanocomposite formed by calcium phosphate and collagen fibrils. And, you know, she's going to tell us about her studies to understand disease um, connection or molecular, how molecular structure relates to disease. Melinda. Okay, thank you very much, May. I'm just going to share my screen and hope that this works. Okay, can you see that? That's okay. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Th thank you, May, for that, that very kind introduction. And, um, and thank you very much for setting this up. I think it's a brilliant idea to have these webinars. And I hope everyone out there is, is well and safe in these strange times. Uh, as you can probably tell from here, that us in the UK are acquiring new skills, learning to cut our own hair and various other things. But anyway, on with the science. So um, probably most of you know that my group works on the structure, the molecular structure of the extracellular matrix. And the extracellular matrix is that substance, the material around cells in a tissue, and it's actually forming the bulk of tissue, structural tissues like skin and bone, tendon and so on. So one of the principal roles of the extracellular matrix is to give tissues their mechanical required properties. But perhaps even more importantly, the molecular structure of the extracellular matrix actually tells the cell what kind of cell it is and tells the cell how to behave. If you like, then ultimately all cell signaling starts from the extracellular matrix. Now in degenerative diseases like osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, vascular disease, cancer, there are substantial extracellular matrix structure changes on the molecular level and on the microscopic level. And they happen due to mechanical wear and tear, due to non-enzymatic chemistry, changes in post-translation modifications, for instance, deposition of plaques. And those extracellular matrix structure changes uh, act to cause cells to behave even more aberrantly and generally progress the disease. Now significantly, many of those structural changes to the extracellular matrix are outside the control of the cells actually in the tissue where the changes are happening. And so they're not druggable because all the drugs in the history of mankind act on cell signaling pathways. But I would argue that in degenerative diseases, that if you try and drug by changing cell signaling pathways, if the extracellular matrix structure is still driving aberrant changes and aberrant behavior in those cells, then you're, those drugs are gonna basically be fighting a losing battle. And what we really need is a new paradigm where we treat the extracellular matrix and we try and restore something like the functional roles of the extracellular matrix components. But of course, to do that, we first of all need to know what the structure of normal extracellular matrix is, how it changes in disease. So broadly speaking, and I hope you can see my arrow on my screen. Good. Um, the extracellular matrix in most tissues comprises fibrils of collagen protein set into a, a proteoglycan hydrogel that uh, uh, also contains a large number of glycoproteins like fibronectin. So the dominant component of most extracellular matrices are collagens, and that's going to be the focus of my talk today. So collagens are triple helical proteins, and they self-assemble out in the extracellular matrix in these very staggered ordered arrays, as I've shown here, with a gap between the end of one molecule and the start of the next. And that arrangement gives rise to this um, very clear periodic sort of alternating structure of so-called overlap and whole zones where the whole zones, because they arise from regions of lower molecular density, are ascribed to regions of higher molecular flexibility. But the organization of those molecules in those fibrils is important, not just from that mechanical perspective, but because it determines what chemical functionalities are here on the outside of the fibril. And of course, that's important because that's how cells interact with their environment and determine their environment, sense their environment, if you like. 
is by the binding of transmembrane proteins like interbrins here to specific binding sites on collagen fibrils and other extracellular matrix components. And that binding then of course triggers a whole cascade of cell signaling processes subsequently. So ultimately we need to know about these binding sites because in disease when this collagen fibril structure changes or the molecular structure of the collagen is changed in some way we can expect the structure of this binding site and the binding dynamics to be drastically changed and that's the ultimate consequence of the cell signaling that then happens. So to examine protein structures of course we need uh, two and three dimensional carbon carbon and carbon nitrogen correlation spectra and that of course requires carbon 13 nitrogen 15 enrichment. And for our purposes, that means enrichment in native in vivo tissues. Uh, because I can't emphasize enough that if you're going to examine the structure of these proteins and their function, we have to do it in situ with all the other proteins they're natively complexed with. Because all of those components are essential for life. And so we can only assume that they're all involved in regulating the structure and dynamics of these important proteins. So some years ago now, we created our so-called heavy mouse model where we fed a mouse 30% uh, of the amino acids in its diet, fully carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 enriched. And that allows us to record these two-dimensional and indeed three-dimensional correlation spectra, uh, which one of the first things we used for was, as it were, as molecular fingerprints to be able to compare the extracellular matrix structures of tissues we might grow in the lab in vitro with the real thing. And before we did that, there was simply no way of making that comparison on the molecular level. And when we took uh, well accepted in vitro models for bone tissue and vascular tissue and tried this method, we actually ended up with NMR spectra that looked absolutely nothing like the in vivo tissue. And so there was actually quite a lot of refinement then of those cell culture processes. But it just demonstrated the need for this molecular fingerprinting process. And then with the advent of DMP, of course, you can see but even very low concentration species in the extracellular matrix. And I'm just showing an example here uh, where we're looking at the very low abundance post-translational modifications of lysine in collagen. And these are essential both for cell signaling and in the case of the uh, crosslinks between um, hydroxylysines for the mechanical stability of the extracellular matrix. So with those kinds of in vivo and in vitro models available, we were then able to go and start trying to answer some of the important biological questions around the extracellular matrix and its function. And one of the things that intrigued me right from the beginning is that collagen proteins are the main mechanical structures of all of our tissues. So they're getting pulled around all the time we move. And yet they also have to provide these well-defined ligand binding sites for cells to bind to. So how can the structure at once do both things? Once one uh, being subjected to global forces and the other much more local forces from cells. Another question we were asking around the same time, which seemed unrelated but turned out not to be, is why does the collagen sequence itself contain so many proline hydroxyproline pairs? So the entire triple helix of the collagen uh, proteins consists of repeats of glycine XY triplets, where the glycine proline hydroxyproline triplet is the most common, uh, and prolines in the structure are always in the X position of the glycine XY triplet, and hydroxyproline is always in the Y position. Now it's of course the constrained backbone structure enforced by the side chain rings that give the uh, backbone twist down the three chains of the a triple helix that allow those chains to actually come together and form a triple helix. But to get that twist to form a triple helix, you don't need proline hydroxyproline pairs. You only need a random distribution of prolines over the X sites and hydroxyprolines over the Y sites. But you can see just how many pairs there are because I've colored all the proline hydroxyproline pairs in collagen type 1 here in pink and the broad bands are for the proline hydroxyproline pairs. So the accepted belief was that putting proline and hydroxyproline together makes for a very, very stable structure and that these proline hydroxyproline pairs represent areas of extreme stability in the structure of the collagens. And so that seemed like a good point for us to start our, structure of, uh, our structural search to understand how the structures of collagens might be changed in situ as opposed to what we might refine. So the backbone structure of prolines and hydroxyprolines is of course determined by the conformation of the ring, which can be endo, the point of the ring pointing towards the uh, peptide backbone, or exo with it pointing away. 
And those two structures, those two conformations have very different dihedral background angles. Uh, the fire dihedral angle is typically different by about 15 degrees between those two conformations, but it can be as much as 40 degrees. And of course, by NMR, we can very easily distinguish those two conformations simply by measuring the gamma carbon chemical shift here, which, as you might imagine, is very much dependent on the conformation. So the proteins in the X position sites are expected to be in the endo conformation because that gives them a backbone structure that fits with the triple helical structure at the X positions in the triple helix. And by the same token, the hydroxy protein is expected to be in the exo conformation. So we use, in this case, a double quantum, single quantum correlation uh, spectrum to allow us to resolve out specifically the CARM13 signals associated with the prolines in these glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets. We utilize the uh, proline effect to do that. And to our surprise, the gamma carbon chemical shift is neither endo or exo, but exactly halfway in between the expected chemical shifts for those two conformations. And that's true also of the delta carbon signal. That of course means that the proline hydroxyproline rings are flipping very rapidly endo to exo. That's no great surprise. But what was a surprise was that there's just no preference between the endo or exo conformations. And that's peculiar to these prolines in these glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets, because if you have instead just glycine proline proline, so you don't hydroxylate the Y position proline, then the X position proline is indeed in the preferential endo conformation. So with our colleagues from the theoretical section upstairs, Professor David Wales and his postdoc Chris Foreman, we did some energy landscape modeling at uh, biologically relevant temperatures for the conformations of the prolines, the dihedral backbone structures of the prolines in glycine proline hydroxyproline pairs. And what you can see here is that the proline can wander around over a really very large area of Ramachandran space, made even larger by the fact that its conformation is dependent on the exo or endo conformation of the next door hydroxyproline. And when you contrast that with a glycine proline flexible amino acid like alanine, the proline in those triplets has a single ground state structure for the endo or the exo conformational states. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that that proline can't move outside of those uh, backbone dihedral angles. It can, but it requires an energy input to do it. Whereas here, the proline in these glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets essentially can wander over this area of Ramachandran space with no energy input. Now that endo exo flip for a proline corresponds to a compression and extension of the triple helix if it occurs in all three chains of the triple helix or a bend if it just occurs in one or two of the three chains. So far from being an area of uh, strong structural stability, in fact these prolines, these glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets are metastable and they're points of very well controlled local he helix flexibility or variable helical pitch. So when you look at where those hydroxyprolines are, prolines and hydroxyprolines are in the collagen fibril, you find that that molecular flexibility is actually conferred across the whole fibril. So what I've drawn here is the collagen arrangement, the collagen molecular arrangement as it is in the fibril, with a lot of the molecules staggered exactly as they are natively. And I've shown in red the glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets. And what you see is that they're far from being randomly arranged. They actually line up very specifically in these bands across the fibrils. Now the cell binding sites I've colored in blue for the integrin binding sites here and here, or the von Willebrand factor here in green. And what you see is that they are always associated with a band of these flexible regions, these now fibril flexible regions. And so our hypothesis is that this local controlled flexibility is controlling the binding dynamics on these cell binding sites. And that this alignment of these glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets and their associated flexibility is essential, therefore, in cell signaling. And by that same token, we would putatively suggest that there is probably an important binding site here, where I've shown in blue, and probably another one somewhere around here, given those bands of proline hydroxyprolines there. So what happens to all of that in disease? Well, I can tell you many things. We've been studying this now for about 10 years or more. So I'm just gonna go through one example and show you where it has led us. 
So a common chemistry that happens to all of us, it's particularly associated with aging and accelerated in diabetes, is non-enzymatic glycation chemistry. So oxidative stress, absolutely universal with aging and many other diseases, thinking of aging as a disease, causes cells to release reactive aldehydes, particularly sugars. And they undergo reactions with the terminal amine groups of lysine and arginine side chains in so-called glycation chemistry. Now, the most characterized products of that glycation chemistry are the so-called advanced glycation end product crosslinks or the age crosslinks, which I've shown here. And primarily the reason they've been so well characterized is as you can see from their structure, many of them fluoresce and they are stable enough that they can be picked up by LCMS. But it's absolutely unclear whether in fact they are the major products of glycation. Um, it would appear that they are not because the strategy of trying to prevent those crosslinks forming doesn't seem to have had any therapeutic benefits, at least in humans. But the universal result of glycation chemistry in collagen is to stiffen the collagen fibrils, and that's why the assumption has always been that there must be a significant number of new crosslinks being formed with the glycation chemistry. So we decided to have a look in some detail at this chemistry because, as I said, preventing the cross-linking formation doesn't seem to be a useful therapeutic strategy to prevent collagen stiffening and all the associated uh, pathologies that come from that. And so we've used now many different model systems. I'm just showing you two here, uh, particularly using in, um, ex vivo and in vitro models and using ribose 5-phosphate and glucose as model glycators that uh, essentially model the various uh, uh, reasons for aldehydes appearing in the extracellular matrix in vivo. Now one of our biggest surprises was that even after incubating a tissue for many months with high concentrations of those sugars, really the only products we could see by NMR were the earliest stages of glycation chemistry and that is these monovalent adducts of sugars to the uh, lysine and arginine side chains. The other big surprise was just how many of those different products they were. In the early stage, it certainly goes well beyond the shift base or even Amadori products, and you have multiple acetal signals, for instance. So the, the glycation chemistry, which I, I won't say we've completely worked through, but I would say substantially now worked through, is incredibly complex and much, much more complex than we could ever have thought of at the start of this. But the biggest surprise was that we could find no evidence whatsoever of glycation crosslinks. By LCMS, we do find some glycation crosslinks. They amount to about one per 50 collagen molecules. But unexpectedly, the, the glycation actually destroys the native enzymatic crosslinks in the collagen fibril. And so overall, we end up in the glycated fibril with less crosslinks than we had to start with. So if it's not glycation crosslinks that's causing the stiffening in glycated collagen, what is it? Well, to answer that question, we actually had to move outside of NMR, and I'm just going to briefly show you. Uh, by studying by, with AFM and TEM, we were able to find out what causes that stiffening. So here is the example with TEM, negative staining. So we're applying a heavy metal urinal acetate stain, which gathers in the whole zones, particularly of the collagen. And that causes these dark light bands when you look at the collagen fibril under TEM. The dark, of course, being because the, uh, the stain tends to collect in the pockets as it were, in the whole zones. Now what you also see by TM, and I hope you can see this on your screens, are these very, very fine subbands, And these are for the, from the alignment of charges, the charges on side chains in the collagen molecules. So the collagen fiber really is that organized. And we've seen many cases of pathology where the pathology is simply caused by disorganization of those uh, alignments. Now in the glycated collagen fibrils, well for start you tend to lose the contrast between whole zone and overlap zone, suggesting that the whole zone now is no longer a pocket for the urinal acetate stain, but is rather full of something else, probably uh, the sugars that have reacted with the collagen. But you absolutely lose the subbanding, the alignment of the charges that you see in normal collagens. So essentially what's going on here is a, a, a longitudinal disorganization of the collagen molecules. So rather than a nice alignment like this, these molecules are actually moved, have been shunted side to side longitudinally. And so we expect that we will lose the alignment of these glycine proline hydroxyprolines. And so we therefore lose the fibril flexibility. I'm now about to be disturbed by a delivery man, so I'm very sorry about that. 
But just to give you an indication why losing the flexible patches causes the whole fibril to become less flexible, imagine I've got two finger joints here. So I'm aligning my two fingers so that the flexible bits, the knuckles, are aligned. And I can flex the whole thing. I can flex the two fingers. Now just move them, disorder them very slightly, and I can't bend. And that's what induces the fibril stiffening with glycation, not cross-links, but just disorganization of the collagen molecules. Now, there are many, many consequences of that. Um, another consequence is a change in the physical chemical properties. Uh, as you might imagine, the collagen fibrils with glycation become more negatively charged. We're essentially knocking out the positive charges on lysines and arginines. And that more negative charge causes a phase separation between the collagen fibrils and their associated proteoglycans. Uh, that has huge effects in many cases. It has an effect on mechanical properties, but it has a particular effect uh, we're beginning to see uh, in cancer. If you imagine phase separation between these, uh, these collagen fibrils and the surrounding hydrogel, proteoglycan hydrogel around them, it facilitates the travel of a cancer cell along this fibril because you've essentially dissociated these two, two components. So just in the last few minutes, I'd like to uh, answer the, something about the question. So having understood more about the extracellular matrix and the functions of its various bits, are we in any kind of position to say, yes, we can now start doing therapy in the extracellular matrix? And I just want to share with you just in a few minutes, just some very new results uh, of something we've been doing just for the last 18 months. Uh, but I should say in the interest of full disclosure that I actually set up a company to fund this work uh, and I am a, both a shareholder and a director of that company, Cambridge Oncology. So we asked ourselves the question, if there's a, indeed phase separation that allows cancer cells to move more readily, if indeed they glycate collagen fibrils and make them more fragile, or indeed just simply degrade the surrounding extracellular matrix, can we stop the cancer cells trying to move from the original tumor site where they're trying to get away from the increasingly hypoxic environment to fresher tissues, as it were? Can we stop that process from happening by modifying the surrounding extracellular matrix around the tumor to prevent this kind of outgrowth of the tumor? So in a nutshell, yes, we can. Um, I'm just gonna show you very briefly some examples of how. Essentially, we can do it by cross-linking the extracellular matrix. Now here we're primarily interested in glioblastoma, which is a, uh, some of you may know, it's a tumor of the, the brain, which is almost um, untreatable. It's treated generally by surgery to remove the bulk, but surgeons can rarely remove the entirety of that tumor because they have to start digging into eloquent sites surrounding the tumor to do that. So this very diffuse tumor tends to get large parts of it left behind even during the surgical process. So what we have here is some three-dimensional uh, matrix models of brain matrix, primarily hyaluronic acid with some brain matrix proteins and serum proteins in there. And we make these three-dimensional tumor spheroids. And you can see that the cells break away from those tumor spheroids very rapidly and start to spread. These are, these are U87 cancer cell line cells for those of you that are interested. Now, what we then did was we put some riboflavin into that same matrix and did nothing for a few days. We let the cells spread as normal for three days. And then we irradiated the sample with ultraviolet, which creates <coughs> uh, oxygen radicals, <coughs> sorry, and causes protein cross-linking. And you can see that by doing that, we've stopped those cancer cells in their tracks. Three days later, they're exactly in the same place as they were when we irradiated the sample. And six days later, here, they still haven't moved. Now, we haven't killed the cancer cells. What we've done is we've caused quiescence. Uh, we, uh, calcine staining shows that the cancer cells are still alive. They're still metabolically active, but they have shrunk. And that's uh, an indication that they have uh, become um, quiescent. They've accumulated lactic acid and that causes the shrinking. So we've used multiple different cross-linking methods. And here I'm just showing you where we've used some patient-derived cells. These are tiny cells, horrible to work with. Um, but they, you can see that they're so small, you can hardly see them, I think, here. But anyway, you can see how they've dispersed thoroughly through our, our model brain extracellular matrix. But where we've cross-linked, we've actually re restrained that little tumour. And this is an example where we're actually diffusing a cross-linkable uh, hyaluronic acid into the uh, brain matrix. Our, uh, our strategy for using this in therapy 
is that during surgery, after surgical resection of the tumour, the surgeon would spray the crosslinker into the tumour bed, allow it to penetrate into the surrounding extracellular matrix and essentially trap the remaining tumour cells that are left after surgery. Uh, ask me in about five years time and I'll tell you if it works. But anyway, so to conclude, um, I would argue that understanding really the fine detail of how the molecular structures in the extracellular matrix perform their very many jobs, both on the global and the local level, allows us to have an insight into how diseases work and therefore how we might uh, mitigate against diseases, not just directly of the extracellular matrix, but also in diseases like cancer. Uh, there's a huge number of people I need to thank here. My amazing group, um, who are listed here. Um, Ying Chao, who's now in Grenoble, has been um, a significant part of all of this, both with the, um, the mouse model and with some of the glycation work, and certainly with the DMP. Um, the others are too numerous to mention, other than Julia is the lead on the cancer work. Karen does all our TM, and without Dave, Dave Reed here, none of this would ever have happened. Uh, our collaborators are many, and we value them greatly. I've just I've listed the ones who've been involved in this work here. Um, I particularly want to highlight the uh, sorry the uh, the biologists because when I started this, as May intimated at the start, I was a theoretical chemist. So without these people, I would know absolutely nothing about this area. And here's the group after a, a coffee and cake morning. And um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Melinda. Um, to the audience, uh, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q and A. Type uh, in the Q and A. So, um, and I can. Right. Yeah, Christian, you start. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, so you 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 had this um, nice model with the finger. Yeah. Uh, and this flexibility, um, uh, um, which then is stopped yeah. if the finger. Yeah. Uh, what, what, uh, but I, I, I fail to understand exactly what has to be aligned there. Are these hydroxy uh, polines on top of each other? Or I mean, what, what exactly is this? And, and of course, it would also not be sufficient probably if it is just one uh, chain, but it yeah. has to be more and so, so on. So, so what, what exactly is happening there? Uh, absolutely. So, so essentially, all flexible regions have to be aligned with other flexible regions. And we've identified the glycine proline hydroxyproline as, as a flexible region of particular mm -hmm. uh, importance for cell binding. Undoubtedly, there are others. Um, essentially, those, those flexible regions have to align. <clears throat> um, so in that case, it is prolines essentially aligning with prolines. Um, without wanting to go on too long on this answer, because I've been told okay. not to. <laughs> but we have done some modeling on that. Um, the charges are very important. Um, four percent of the four to five percent of the charges in the molecule uh, basically determine the alignment, and I, I'm happy to talk more about that later. But basically, it was an ev we did a study of the evolution of collagen. Okay, uh, so um, the questions are coming in, Melinda. So yeah. let me um, uh, read uh, the first question from anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, part one: How do you specifically target tumor cells? Part two, would there be any side effects in using this therapy? Part three, what would be the time duration of such therapies? Okay, fantastic questions. Wish I could tell you the exact answer to all of them. Uh, we're working on all of those. Uh, targeting the tumor cells, one of the reasons we're starting with surgery is so we don't have to. Um, essentially, we're using um, crosslinkers that tend to be slightly hydrophobic, and we know that the um, the environment in the glioblastoma case is broadly hydrophobic, which the rest of the brain is not. So that's our target. Um, it's going to be to start with diffusion times uh, to make sure we don't hit more eloquent parts of the brain. Uh, our studies so far in vitro suggest it's not going to be crucial not to hit any part of the, uh, the rest of the brain. Um, I can't tell you about side effects yet. We don't know. Um, um, sorry, I've lost the rest of the question. Uh, where, where are we? Um, time, dura yeah. time duration. So far, in, uh, so far, we've kept cells alive for uh, uh, three to four months in vitro, and they haven't broken out yet. Okay. All right. Um, this uh, the questions come in random order. Uh, anyways, from Peter. Um, great talk. The concentration of calcium is relatively high in extracellular space. 
Does calcium affect the conformation and flexibility of collagen? Oh, very good question. Um, I don't know. Of course, collagen calcifies um, and there's a very specific um, reason why collagen calcifies in some cases to do with the particular cross-linking and the strain on it. Um, mm, it must do. I don't know specifically how, uh, but it must do. Yes, you're right. Okay. Um, Robert Tico has a question. Um, from talking to my friend who studies the physical basis for metastasis, I've learned that cancer cells actually remodel the surrounding extracellular matrix to make, make its uh, mechanical properties more hospitable. What do you think of this? Can you see such things in your experiments? Uh, yes, they absolutely do. And yes, we can. Uh, it's not just the cancer cells. They also signal to other cells, including macrophages. I mean, in pancreatic tumors in vitro, we see macrophages um, producing collagen. Um, so yes, they absolutely do. Not just cancer cells, other cells do too. But so can you see- uh, I have a related question, if I may, yeah, uh, yeah. related to the role of matrix metalloproteinases and the elastase and the other uh, remodeling proteins, because remodeling is an important uh, process in the extracellular matrix. So your yeah. changes in flexibility, is it related to uh, resistance to remodeling or vice versa? Sorry, in the cancer case, in the cancer in, in, case, yes. um, there, it, it, it is, depends entirely on the particular tumour you're looking at and it can depend on the patient you're looking at. So um, there are a lot of metalloproteases that get expressed by tumour cells in different settings um, and by fibroblasts that are associated with those tumours that degrade collagen, fibronectin, um, Interestingly, in the glioblastoma case, we expected to see uh, hyaluronidases. We don't. Uh, we've looked and looked for them. We do not see them. Uh, we, what we see, uh, even with patient-derived cells, is the expression of um, matrix components we would more normally associate with basement membrane, fibronectin, um, 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 brevican, is all, all of the normal brain proteoglycans are massively reduced in concentration. So. Um, there is remodeling, there are new components come in, there's a lot of degradation. Um, remember, you've also got an acidic environment, um, in most cases from lactic acid being expressed. Um, yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it really depends on the particular tumor you're talking about, the stage it's at, the, the patient and the tissue that it's in. But there is, we, in vitro, we've seen huge amounts of degradation caused by cancer cells, we've seen remodeling, We've seen changes in post-translation modifications of existing tissue, um, and we've seen deposition of proteins we absolutely didn't expect to be there, but they are found in vivo in patients. Um, let me uh, point to an NMR-oriented question. NMR is a short-range, uh, a technique to report short-range interactions. How do you get global alignment of the red regions in the collagen? I think the uh, person is referring to slide number 13 where you have these. Yeah, good question. Very good question. Um, I, and I sort of intimated, alluded to it slightly before. Um, it's charges. It's charge-charge interactions that align the molecules. Um, and as I was saying earlier, four to five percent of the charges in the collagen molecule are responsible for most of that alignment. Uh, we know that through molecular modeling studies and by knocking out those charges with things like glycation. Uh, you also see it um, in um, some mutations. There are some mutations of collagen, not collagen type one, where you see disorder uh, even from one arginine being replaced by a non-charged residue. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't come from actual chemical shift or a direct uh, NMR measurement. This is from other... No, it doesn't. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. Um, here's a sort of a partially related question as a follow-up to the EM-AFM studies. Was the change in overall structure or misalignment observed in the molecular on the molecular level, i.e. amino acid X is no longer on top of amino acid Y? Um, it... it <laughs> Yes, it ha the TEM results suggest that yes, that has to be the case, that there is, there is disorder of the molecules. In terms of changes in molecular structure that we can observe by NMR, there are some small ones, but they are small. Um, they're primarily in the side chain orientations. Uh, there's some very, very small shift in alpha carbon and uh, carbon or carbon chemical shifts, suggesting a, a slight shift towards a, a more random coil structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
So I think there are some more questions more biologically related, um, but maybe in the interest of time, we save those questions for... Yeah, sure. I I'm reading them. They're really interesting. <laughs> Stay around. I'll answer them at the end. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Melinda, for a very nice talk. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you also from my side. And um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Claudio Lucinat full professor of chemistry at the University of Florence, director of the Center of Magnetic Resonance, as well as the Inter-University Consortium on Magnetic Resonance of Metalloproteins. He has a very broad scientific interest and uh, that includes NMR-based structural methodologies, electron and nuclear relaxation and the relaxometry, NMR of paramagnetic species and bioinorganic chemistry, and more recently, metabolomics. And I think his research has uh, had a great impact, which is shown by almost 30,000 citations of his papers. And yeah, most recently, um, Claudia has become one of the international reference points for metabolomics. Um, and he has also received several awards, like uh, the Premio Sapio in 2017 and the Richard Ernst Prize in Magnetic Re Resonance in uh, 2018. Yeah, Claudio, I'm uh, very excited to see what you've been up to most recently, and I leave the stage to you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so let's see if everything works. Um, share screen. Okay, so thanks. Let me start. Um, So uh, first, let me try to justify the title because uh, most people know in this audience that NMR is a very versatile technique. There are dozens and dozens of things that you can do by NMR. So that's one of the reasons why we like NMR so much. But on the other hand, often, or at least in some cases, NMR is uh, deemed as the best, the second best technique because there may be more specialized techniques that do one thing or another thing better than NMR. And um, this has been the case for structural biology. Now it's probably the, the, the third best because of, uh, of the advent of cryo-EM. If you think about structures, if you think of dynamics, things are different. And it could be the same for metabolomics. So what I will try to tell you today and to give you some reasons uh, for NMR being actually the best technique to do at least some things with metabolomics. And so, uh, let's see. Okay. So this is the place I come from. This is the Center for Magnetic Resonance of the University of Florence. The numbers are the machines. And you see the, the latest acquisition is the 1.2 gigahertz, which I uh, selected as a background picture for my presentation today. And you see that uh, some of these machines are dedicated either 100% of the time or for some part of the time to metabolomics. Now you may ask whether we, do, we need the 1.2 gigahertz to do metabolomics, probably not, but for some things uh, it might be useful from time to time to go to very high field. I like to show you this on the spectrum, uh, which is the first 1.2 gigahertz spectrum of a urine sample. Uh, so it's a, it's a quite expensive spectrum if you want, but uh, that was the very first that was taken at Brooker when uh, we were still testing the instrument last September. And you can see that the resolution is fantastic and uh, there is a lot of signals. This slide also somehow tells you uh, how much information is contained in a spectrum of a body fluid. I mean, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of signals that can, in principle, be uh, reconducted to metabolites, specific metabolites, which means that in one single spectrum, you have a lot of information on the, um, let's say, metabolic uh, distribution in, in a body fluid. This is urine, but uh, the same holds for blood, for many other different uh, liquid samples like uh, cerebral spinal fluid, like uh, saliva, uh, you, you name it. So um, what do we do by NMR? You can do many things. 
And uh, the point I want to make with you today is that uh, not all the things that you can do by NMR are actually done best by NMR, but some are. So if you start from NMR data and, uh, and you just look at the NMR spectra of uh, a number of samples of a given body fluid, let's say urine or, or plasma or serum, you can either decide not to have any prior knowledge of the metabolites of interest, and this is what is called untargeted analysis, or you are looking for something specific, and then you go and look for those metabolites in particular, and then you do a targeted analysis. Now, for doing targeted analysis, as you may know, there, is, uh, there are other techniques, particularly mass spec in, in its various uh, uh, ways, that uh, can actually do this better, sensitivity sire, and uh, you can actually go and look for the best uh, mass mass spectrometry uh, approach to actually uh, find what you're looking for. But when you don't know what you're looking for, when you want to do, uh, let's say, fingerprinting, just try to see uh, whatever may come as interesting in a spectrum, then this is the, the, best, uh, the best strategy. And uh, I don't know if you, yes. So this is the, the pathway that uh, I would like to drive you through today go through the spectra, the, divide the spectra into bins or buckets, and then analyze the intensity, the integral of each of these buckets by uh, statistical techniques. And by statistical approaches, you can actually really learn a lot. Then, of course, you can still quantify metabolites, but this is a, a, something that you may do or may not want to do, depending on the type of study. So I've selected a few examples of, uh, of work that we have done over the years. It's uh, like Melinda was saying, it's uh, more than 10 years that we are doing metabolomics among other things. So I had to select uh, something that would provide you with some uh, flavor for what you can actually do. So uh, you'll see graphs of this type quite often because these are um, PCA plots or PLS plots <clears throat> where you, you look at the distribution of one or two or more canonical components in the statistical analysis. And for instance, in this particular case, where you look at people affected by celiac disease and controls, that the fingerprint, without actually saying anything about the uh, metabolites that are in the fingerprint, the fingerprint clearly tells you that there is a, a separation between people affected by celiac disease and controls with a few exceptions, of course, but uh, I mean, uh, you cannot expect everything. We are just simplifying very much everything because we are just looking at uh, the way the fingerprints differentiate people affected by a particular disease from people who are, let's say, healthy, or at least taken as healthy. So what was also important to find, and we realized that uh, very quickly, was that if, as you know, celiac people can be uh, not cured, but uh, celiac disease can be uh, silenced if you, if you just avoid the gluten from your diet. So these people have been prescribed gluten-free diet, and uh, as soon, in a, in a matter of a few months or almost a year, these people were put on a gluten-free diet, you see that the green points that are the former red points that are moving to the right-hand side of the graph. So this is a, finger, a molecular fingerprint, and without actually knowing what molecules are talking about, that already tells you that the gluten-free diet is moving your uh, metabolic uh, signature, your metabolic fingerprint towards a healthy situation. And what was even more interesting was that, uh, if you look at the axes, the axes are the so-called uh, um, potential celiac people, so people who have the antibodies that uh, tell that they are celiac, but they have no symptoms, they live well and they eat whatever they like. But uh, sooner or later, most, not all, but most of these people develop celiac disease. So we were expecting that uh, this uh, potential celiac were more or less normal, but the result is that most of them are actually in the, in the field of the celiac people, which means that the metabolic fingerprint is actually telling you before symptoms that uh, you have uh, celiac disease, which is something that we have seen over and over for several different diseases, and which is something that make us think that the metabolic fingerprinting, and as a chemist, I mean, I wouldn't even like to admit that, but as a chemist, we shouldn't care for the individual metabolites. 
if a fingerprint is in a statistically significant way telling you that a person has some kind of disease, you should take that seriously. You should take that uh, as an indication and then maybe go to a more specific test. Again, NMR is the second best, which means that uh, you are not competing with, uh, for instance, the antibody test for celiac disease, which is accurate at 97%. We are only accurate 80, 85%. But that's not so relevant. I mean, you can easily do a blood test. People do a blood test every one, one or two years anyway. And from a blood test, if you see the fingerprint of celiac disease, then you should go and take the antibodies. Most people become celiac without actually knowing that they are at risk. So um, just a few other examples. This is colorectal cancer. This, uh, um, this study was actually on people who were severely ill and uh, were in the third line treatment. So all of them died. And when we got the samples, the, the, well, the collection was made to test the efficacy of uh, two different uh, um, chemotherapies, but we were not interested in that. We were interested in trying to see whether there was a fingerprint of the uh, life expectancy of these people. And having a fingerprint of life expectancy is important because you can tune the palliative care. If life expectancy is very short, you can be more blunt. If it is rather long, you have to be careful. And so this is coming up extremely well. If you, if you know what these uh, Kaplan-Meier plots mean, they actually, we are able to discriminate quite efi efficiently between long survivors and short survivors with a hazard ratio of 3.3, which is by far better than any other marker that is actually presently used for predicting life expectancy. So again, it looks like there is a fingerprint of celiac disease here that, uh, uh, sorry, of, of uh, uh, colorectal cancer, which is a more severe disease, of course, that it's there and uh, it's for us to analyze, it's for us to understand. And um, uh, speaking about breast cancer, again, we can distinguish people with or without metastasis women with or without metastasis. And it turned out that the same fingerprint of women with metastasis may be actually helpful to test women with no sign of metastasis at the time of surgery, that they may develop metastasis. So it's another way to predict prognosis in this case, to predict uh, recurrence or lapse that is entirely based to a difference in the metabolic profile. And of course, the difference in the metabolic profile may not come from the few metabolites that are released by a few metastatic cells around, but probably by the immune response that uh, any individual would uh, exert when there are metabolic cells around. And immune response, you can look at that from the metabolic point of view as an amplifier of, of, uh, of the disease. And that is probably why we have some degree of success in predicting things before symptoms or in being prognostic before actually the outcome is, is known. Um, okay, I will cut short. This is, uh, these are the rock curves that uh, tell you how, uh, how strong is, the, the, is our ability of, of uh, discriminating one case from another. And in the case of uh, the metastatic breast cancer, we are able to predict with an area under the curve of 0.86, which means uh, a, an accuracy of about 80%, which is not bad because there are several cases which are borderline and then uh, the, the oncologist may or may not decide to give a certain treatment. So this is yet another tool that may help the oncologist to select the best treatment in the interest of the patient. And with, this was repeated because uh, many times we get the, the, well, the, the objection from referees that uh, the cohort is not that large, which is true, which is true. We usually work with a few hundred cases. It's very difficult to go beyond that because you need to do a multi-center study and uh, you, know, you need to go to the thousands or even tens of thousands, which is, uh, which is now the present target, but it's not, we are not there yet. But in this case, we got samples from uh, a relatively large collection of, of uh, breast cancer, uh, blood of uh, women affected by breast cancer from all over the world and mostly from Southeast Asia. So uh, 
well, say, let's say less developed countries, and uh, the, let's say, the sensitivity is almost intact. So we can still uh, use our model, our um, model for metastasis and predict with a reasonable accuracy, so the error is now a little bit below 0.8, but uh, with uh, significant accuracy, what would be the fate of this treatment? And again, this was a retrospective study, so we knew already who was going to develop uh, metastasis and who was not going to develop metastasis. But of course, we did it completely blindly, so the result was very, very encouraging. And I think this is the last example from, uh, let's say, biomedicine. Uh, this is the two years risk of death after uh, um, myocardial infarction, acute myocardial infarction. And again, we just took the spectra, this is serum now, uh, about a thousand samples, which was not bad. And uh, we found the fingerprint of risk of death, which was uh, quite strong. So again, uh, this can help uh, physicians to, to actually prescribe the most appropriate uh, maintenance care for people who had uh, acute myocardial infarction based on the NMR spectrum of this uh, and of the blood of these people. And the uh, area under the curve, you see it's uh, quite nice. And again, uh, we were rather, rather specific in detecting the, the risk of uh, this, which means the risk of, of a strong recurrence of a cardiovascular problem, of course, in this case. And of course, you need to compare with predictors that are already there. So the best uh, available is this GRACE, a global registry of acute coronary events, which is the green curve. And uh, our nosy base, that this is a one, old 1D spectra. Sometimes we call them nosy, sometimes they are the CPMG 1D spectra, but that's uh, technical, it doesn't really mean much. But you see that the red is actually better than the green. The area under the curve goes from 0.81 to 0.86. And if you combine them, you go to 0.975, so the blue curve, which means that the information contained in the metabolomic uh, analysis is not 100% uh, overlapped with the clinical um, observables that are used for these uh, scores, like the GRACE score in this case. So we are actually looking at something which is complementary and not overlapping with existing markers. Okay, I could go on and uh, I will not, but uh, this is a list of uh, diseases that we have actually looked at by metabolomics. And uh, in, in all cases, I have a few more that uh, were unsuccessful. They are not listed here, but in all cases listed here, we were able to derive a fingerprint for the disease or for the recurrence or for the prognosis or whatever. The yellow ones have been published, the white ones are still in progress. But this is just to tell you that uh, with a very simple approach, not looking at any single metabolite, we can actually learn a lot. And I would like to try to tell you why this is so. With accuracy is between 75 and 90%. Now, 90% is a remarkable accuracy for a simple 1D NMR spectrum of a body fluid. So uh, something to be taken in mind because uh, my personal dream would be that uh, when you go and get uh, a blood test, uh, blood analysis, like most of us do every now and then, you get an extra aliquot for an MR, and then you get uh, your, your fingerprint is compared with the fingerprint of the disease for which we have this fingerprint, which are absolutely not so many. You, you see them listed here, but it's uh, just a little extra effort. The cost of a single NMR analysis would be, if you scale it up properly, would be not more than 10, 15 euros which just adds uh, to the cost of the other, of the other um, analytes that uh, are usually searched in this type of analysis. So why not? I mean, I think uh, the only drawback, of course, is uh, first of all, uh, to demonstrate to the health system that uh, this is robust and we should be able to go from uh, a thousand or a few thousand to several tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, uh, cohorts very large, uh, so to be able to show that uh, this is actually working on, uh, uh, let's say, epidemiological scale, not just on a lab scale. So it's a long way to go. But we do think that there is a lot uh, to learn and it would be a real pity uh, not to take an extra aliquot to, to actually try to build 
of course, to build more information, because the more you get, the more you, you can actually fingerprint, and uh, to provide extra hints uh, to, the, uh, to the health of the people. So, the other point I want to make uh, is, uh, well, it's a technical, but it's a very important point. Um, separation of uh, groups like uh, healthy versus diseased and so on, uh, by fingerprinting becomes more reliable before metabolite fingerprinting is, becomes reliable. Because you, you, you go from a univariate analysis, if you look at metabolites one by one, and mind you, NMR is very good in doing that. NMR is intrinsically quantitative, so we can go and look for each individual metabolites, but it takes time, it needs uh, some kind of automation that is not fully there yet, although uh, Brucher has made many progress in this area. We ourselves have done something in this area. So I'm saying that uh, univariate analysis can only grow and provide more and more metabolites. But to get the information that you get in one shot from a fingerprint analysis, you would need to ideally uh, identify and quantify all the metabolites in the spectrum. And this would never be achieved. So uh, we are improving, but for the moment, uh, if you want to improve the discrimination between two groups and the numerosity is not that high, multivariate analysis is by far better than univariate analysis. You can always go back and look for metabolites if you get some ideas or some hints about the biology of the problem, but that is not necessary to be able to discriminate between two groups. So I hope this message is emerging because uh, so if you want, uh, you have a plot like this. So from the fingerprint, uh, you get this much of discriminating ability. If you want to get the same discriminating ability by analyzing metabolites one by one, you need to analyze many, many metabolites and ideally all the metabolites. Then of course, uh, asymptotically, you would get to this, uh, to this uh, discriminating ability. But uh, I would say that normally we are about here. So in order to get, uh, a fingerprint by profiling, that means by looking at individual metabolites, you would need uh, a significant amount of work for each spectrum to make sure you don't make mistakes. And then you are still below the total discriminating ability. Okay. Um, of course you can do food, so you can look at milk. I will not tell you anything, but uh, we have made a few interesting observations. So you can look at coffee, you can look at olive oil, at uh, all, uh, cheese, whatever you would like to analyze by NMR. And we still call it uh, metabolomics because yeah, actually you look at metabolites mostly. Even bigger molecules, but it's mostly metabolites. So this is a, a, a whole field which we are also interested in. And uh, we actually offer a service to, to local companies, farm uh, factories uh, and so on for food, because uh, there is an increasing demand from the consumers to actually know the origin, to get a, a, an assessment of the quality, which is objective and not subjective and so on and so forth. So this is another whole field that I will not uh, talk much about. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is uh, uh, the fact that the metabolic profile even the metabolic profile of urine, which is uh, the most variable body fluid, because of course it depends on what uh, you have eaten the day before and whether you have made uh, physical exercise or whatever, you can still recognize people. And this is something, this is what we did uh, when we started more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that individuals are recognizable by their urine fingerprint. And that even after 10 years, we were able to get hold of uh, the same people, which were at that time, students and postdocs in our lab, and then uh, we, we chased them around the world to, to please provide more samples after 10 or 12 years. The, most of them did. And you see that the prediction accuracy, except for three cases, this one and these two here, it's quite high. So we can recognize, we can tell who uh, is the owner of that particular urine sample after 10 or 12 years which is remarkable. That means that there is a background in urine that is again a fingerprint of the person. It's not a fingerprint of, uh, of what happened the day before. And of course, the fingerprint of the person also contains the fingerprint of uh, its uh, microbiota. So it's not only our own fingerprint, but it's a fingerprint of our uh, microbiome, 
which is part of us. And it's good and bad, but it's more good than bad, usually. Okay, this is something which is uh, more technical and not so interesting, except for, for a very few people. Uh, so the bucketing pro process that we do to do this type of analysis has been criticized because uh, most people think that if you take the spectrum and you slice it into buckets, you lose information. And uh, this is true if you want to look at metabolites, so if you want to do profiling, but it's absolutely not true if you want to do uh, our type of analysis, the fingerprinting. Because uh, if you bucket within the more or less with the bucket of the size of the line width, you don't lose anything. Actually, you do gain because you remove some of the noise. So, and this is a plot, uh, this is the full spectrum, and this is the size of the buckets. So if you increase the size too much, you do lose accuracy. But if the size is around 0 0.02 ppm, which are standard procedure, even 0.04, you see that uh, the prediction accuracy is close to 100%. So, and we have other, um, other experiments. We have just submitted this paper, so I don't know how it will be uh, refereed, but uh, we think it's an important point to make for the people who do metabolomics, that uh, bucketing is actually the recommended procedure for fingerprinting, not for profiling, but for fingerprinting. And so the point is, uh, um, going back to the urine, why people are recognizable? what's in the urine that is so much recognizable. Because if you look at uh, a few tens of metabolites, you don't get such a, a strong recognition. So there is something more in the urine. And the something more, we think we know what it is. It's a shift, it's a chemical shift. Because uh, urine is a complex matrix and the chemical shift uh, is affected by the composition of the matrix. So not only the uh, individual metabolites, but the whole set of metabolites is influenced the shift of all the other metabolites. So there is information in the shift. Of course, the information would be redundant if again, we could quantify all the metabolites, but this is an impossible task. So um, we uh, capitalized on this observation and we published this paper. I want to point to this one because it was done in collaboration with Brooker, Manfred Sproul and Artmut Schaeffer. And I think, uh, I, I shouldn't be the one to say that, but I think this is a real milestone because we have been able to uh, predict the position of signals given a certain matrix. So we made a, a fake uh, urine sample, which is about 4,000 4, samples. And uh, we measured the position, the shift of uh, about uh, 100 metabolites. And we could establish a one-to-one -one relationship between the two in such a way that we can actually, given the shift of a few metabolites in urine, be able to predict the position of all other metabolites, which is a very big step forward towards automation. Because if metabolites change position from one sample to another, it's a, it's a real challenge for any uh, software to be able to identify them correctly. And uh, it's very easy that you can mistake one metabolite with another. I think I will stop here. Uh, I won't have time to discuss this one, but again, it's more for uh, people who like the, te not the technicalities of NMR, which is also very interesting. And uh, I think I will stop with this message. So you have uh, an individual and you can probably be able to predict the evolution of this individual towards uh, several diseases or towards a healthy aging by following uh, periodically it's body fluids. And uh, we do believe that. Uh, of course, last is uh, SARS-CoV-2, which we are working on. It's actually, it's a study designed on the disease. So on the people affected by COVID-19. And uh, we see nice things. This is an international project, uh, but I won't be able to tell you anything specific because for the moment it's kept among the participants to the project, but we do see interesting things in the people depending on how they have been affected by the by the disease and of course precision medicine you can get everything into a chip and uh, take with you all the information on your metabolic profile uh, second best yes nmr is 10 percent with respect to 90 percent of mass spec but in the last five years we went up to 25 percent so maybe the battle is not lost and in any case, I think it's fun because we can do things that you cannot do by mass spec. Of course, we may not be able to do things that mass spec is very good at. 
And with this, really, thank you all for your attention. Yeah, Claudio, thank you yes. very much for your nice talk. Uh, you. We already have some questions from the audience. I think I'll just start from the very top. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's one question related to uh, the, the bucketing you mentioned. Um, so going for high magnetic field, among other factors, increases your spectral res resolution. But then before statistical analysis, you use binning of the spectra, which reduces the resolution. Apart of uh, higher sensitivity, are there any other reasons to use high field and uh, spectral binning combo? Okay, that's a very, it's a very interesting question. So, no, I think uh, we do not need to use very high field to do this metabolic fingerprinting. Absolutely. Actually, we are working the other way around. We try to demonstrate that you can use an 80 or 90 megahertz and practically not lose anything for fingerprinting. So why high resolution NMR and high fields is important? It's important for assigning uh, metabolites. So take a spectrum uh, at 1.2, let's say, but I mean 900 or uh, 1 giga and uh, do all the 2D experiments that uh, are uh, foolproof, able to tell you what are the metabolites. So to have an accurate assignment of, let's say, instead of 100, 200, 300 different metabolites, even in very low amount, because you, are, you have a higher sensitivity. So you should do that uh, once in a while, and then apply all that you have learned to lower field spectra and uh, do your fingerprinting and possibly your profiling with, uh, with uh, better uh, um, with better ability to, to discriminate one group from another, for instance. Okay, then uh, so with the 1.2 gigahertz, uh, do you intend to migrate to a 2D analysis of the spectra as well? Yeah, yeah, no, we do that already. I mean, we've been doing that uh, often with the 950, which was the highest field we had before the 1.2. And uh, indeed, you learn a lot of things. And uh, once you learned, uh, you've learned. So you know where they are. And uh, it's very easy if you take a number of samples to really identify signals that you would not be absolutely sure to identify by just looking at the 600 megahertz spectrum. 600 is the, is the standard field for uh, metabolomics in biomedicine. 400 is the standard field for metabolomics in uh, food. Okay. Uh, one other question, um, are you aware if there are any fingerprints common to several types of diseases that uh, could be directly addressed clinically? Um, uh, yes, but, so uh, I have to say that, uh, um, well, medical doctors are rather conservative and I think that's good. I think that's good because as a patient, if I go to a doctor, I don't want the doctor to experiment on me the, the latest uh, whatever. So I'm happy that doctors are conservative, but uh, at the same time, we need to convince them that this is an, a new tool that can complement the tools that are already available. And I think more than convincing medical doctors, we need to convince uh, the health systems, the national health systems, that this is an analysis that can be done uh, uh, population-based. It's not so expensive. Instruments are expensive, but uh, the number of samples you can run per year is bringing the cost down a lot. So indeed, you need a few people who are trained to use the NMR, trained in the sense of pushing the button because it's not like doing fancy experiments like we all like to do. So it's something that could actually migrate to the hospitals and uh, to many hospitals because uh, getting, the metab getting the samples is easy but you cannot carry the samples around uh, the, the country. So you need local places where the samples can be analyzed. And this is doable. Uh, we only need to convince the health system that uh, this is uh, going to pay back in the long run and actually make a saving for the health system because it's, uh, it improves prevention. It may improve prevention a lot. So there are, there are some diseases for which there is strong evidence that uh, we can actually predict, make an early diagnosis with an accuracy of, let's say, 80 to 90%, which is not uh, ideal, but it's better than nothing if you do that uh, with a minimal effort. And then you can address the people to more specific tests. So it's a first line screening. And in this sense, an MR is better than mass spec because it's faster, more quantitative, and even less sensitive, but it's, it's actually better. 
Um, I think I have a great follow-up question to that. Um, so, um, great seminar, very convincing results. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, my question concerns the actual spread of the NMR diagnostic and prognostic approaches in the public and private medical laboratories. In spite the technique is robust, versatile, and has undoubtedly a lot of advantages, we do not see an increase of diffusion of dedicated NMR labs in public and provoked labs. So is there any action to promote further the technique in order um, to become a standard in health monitoring? <laughs> that is a very good question. And I've discussed that with Brucher a lot of times. So the problem is uh, uh, that there is a small misunderstanding in, in, in among the people who do metabolomics by NMR that uh, one can actually do it uh, um, as a service. So uh, people send the samples, so you do the analysis and you send the samples back that is not going to work in the long run because the capacity of a single lab, even a big lab like ours, is not, uh, is not great. Then the other option is uh, private. And uh, there is an example in Europe uh, from, from uh, Finland that is a, is a very powerful operation where people do send samples and get answers. That is not the way to go either because uh, uh, if you want to do it on a population basis, you have to do it where the people live you cannot think of sending the samples around. The, besides all the problems in sending biological samples and the privacy issues and stuff, but you really need to have it locally. So how to convince uh, health systems is difficult because health systems uh, would, uh, would immediately say that this is, uh, the, the initial cost is very high, which is true. But if you think of MRI, I mean, MRI started as something that uh, radiologists wouldn't even want to look at. And then we know that MRI is, uh, is spread. Uh, there are something like five or 10,000 MRI instruments uh, in Europe, very well spread. So five or 10,000, uh, 600 megahertz spectrometers would cost much less than five or 10,000 MRIs. And they would do a good job. So it's a matter of convincing some, some health system. I was actually thinking of, uh, since Brucher is based in Switzerland, I'll be part of it, or convincing the, the Swiss federal government because they have lots of money. The population is not uh, that high, but it's a significant example. If they would uh, adopt this uh, on a trial basis for like five or 10 years, and if in Switzerland they get convinced that this is going to work, I think everybody else in the world would be. So I talked to Brucher to say, you, you need to talk to the, feder to the federal government of Switzerland. I don't know the result yet. And I think we have time for uh, one last question. Um, so could the metabolic fingerprint be used as a blind diagnosis method, uh, meaning you basically look at the metabolic profile and identify some specific diseases? And uh, where would you see limitations of this in terms of age, gender, lifestyle, and so on? Um, okay, so uh, for the moment, and I think uh, it will be like this for a, for a while, we actually need to build a fingerprint of a specific disease by looking at people with that specific disease. And then once the fingerprint is robust and is significantly different from healthy people, then you can look at unknown samples and say, well, this sample matches with the fingerprint of the disease. There was a question, uh, I saw it passing on the question and answer panel, uh, of someone who said, what about uh, comorbidities? The question was not phrased like that, but I think that was the point. And indeed, we, I mean, we are at the beginning of that. So we actually don't know whether there are diseases that can be um, mistaken one for another. But in our limited experience, for instance, in cardiovascular, we have seen that uh, uh, what is called heart failure, which is a cardiovascular problem, is totally different from other cardio cardiovascular problems. So we do hope that uh, there is some kind of uh, discriminating ability even among diseases. So when you, when you say healthy controls, as you know, a control may or may not be healthy. It's just a person that has not been diagnosed any disease, but that doesn't mean that that person is healthy. So our healthy controls are in fact a mixture of people who are really healthy, if, if we agree on the term, and people who have something but don't know. So it's already uh, somehow dirty as, uh, as, uh, as the process, but it's, uh, it's better than nothing. And for the moment, we have not seen big confounding effects. Oh, we do see differences between men and women, of course, uh, 
uh, we see children who are different from adults. We see there is significant uh, fingerprint of age, which starts uh, around my age, uh, <laughs> maybe a little earlier, around Christian's age. <laughs> and then it goes, it progresses. But we have looked at uh, ultracentenarians, and the ultracentenarians look actually younger than people who are 80 years old or so. So they have something special in their genome that is reflected in the metabolome. So all of this should be taken into account, of course, because uh, if you want to be robust uh, in predicting the disease, you need to take into account that there are age differences, sex differences, and many other things. Okay, I think that's it with the uh, official part. Uh, Melinda, thank you again. Thank you, Claudio. And uh, of course, uh, thanks for everyone participating in this and uh, joining us for the two seminars. And yeah, hope to see you next week. <laughs>